announcement of people coming in. Um, I want you to still be able to eat. Um, this is, we're not quite ready to start with the panel. I just thought I would do some little housekeeping, little things like that. We're going to be here together until 3. This first part is where you get to know and meet people at your table. And if you don't like them, change tables. Because <laughs> one of the things we hear is that it's very important to meet your peers, meet other certificates, and kind of see what happens there. Um, I thought I would like to start out by uh, recognizing some people that are here, uh, just to give you an idea. But do you need five more minutes to eat? Where are you? I mean, tell me. Need five? You've been asked for five. I'm going to check back in at five. Bye. You know, if you're down at the table, you can still choose. The panelists can't choose. So, I promise that I want to have the panelists not choose. Make those kind of changes. Why don't we just, well, let me just kind of like start out with some little housekeeping and some recognition and kind of like what we're doing here. First of all, um, um, some of you may remember that we're, we actually have a committee that has oversight of this particular program. They call the Certification and Governance Committee, and we have some of the members here. So I'd like to ask uh, uh, Andrea Moore if you would stand, uh, Carolyn Judge, Vince Arroyo. He's a member of it. Is Don Stepich here? Is Don Kirky here? Please stand. Okay. Um, uh, Charlotte, are you here? Have you had to leave? I know she's been really catching the plane. There she is in the back. Uh, and, and I got Andrea. We, I know that we're missing uh, Char. I believe Rob had to leave. Rob Fouché, he's gone. Okay. Am I missing anybody else from the group? I'm missing Stepich in the room, and I'm missing Fauché, and I'm missing Sean. Oh, and Don, Pat, Pat yeah. Okay, David, wave your hand. Dave, David Padley is the U.S. Coast Guard. He's a, he's a boat swing, and he is our most recent CPT. <laughs> thank, thank you very, very much. Right. And how many in the room uh, are actually of applications. Would you stand for me? Come on. We're still on the viewers. Uh, we do have 128 of you. And uh, one of my reviewers came up and talked about the fact that she hadn't been to a conference in a number of years. And that she's really liking the CPT update. And that got her to come back. She thought the CPT update gave her a sense of feeling of community. So we'd like some other people liking the update. If you really want me to do anything different with that little update, please tell me. Otherwise, you're going to be subjected to only my hallucinations about <laughs> what it is I think you need to know and what I want to share. But I really enjoy putting that together uh, every month. And I really like to feature you. We, we have some, uh, we have, you have peers who are really doing great work. Uh, writing books, getting other awards, and what have you, doing some exciting kind of stuff. And we sometimes have some critical dialogue about things. I thought I would write up a little bit of Irana's presentation yesterday. She's with Microsoft uh, talking about, I had met with the advocates about how to get to the C, how to get to the C-suite, and I thought I would build on what she said, I'll be sharing that or something like that. Uh, by the way, who in the room is among our most recent, this class, this year's class of CPTs. I know David is. Who else here is our newbie? Come on, don't just raise your hand, stand up. <laughs> we, we really do welcome you, and I think we think that's great. By the way, uh, we do have some guests with us today who are not CPTs, and uh, one of those is Deb Page, who's actually our closing keynoter. And I wanted you to know that Deb is actually a candidate for the CPT. So we're going to go with you.
Do we have any uh, CPTs in the room who are not from the United States proper? Do we have some of those other ones? Uh, yes, what's well, a Canadian back there? We have a South African. Well, come on, stand up. Come on, come on. I, it won't work. It helps with digestion. Stand up. The next most recent one, David was the very last one, but the gentleman before him is from Poland. And it just put us in a whole new country, so I was very, that's why we're up to 25 countries. So we, we are now in Poland. I thought that was very, very nice. Uh, do we have anybody in here who represents our, some of our academic partners? How about uh, uh, Boise? Do we have any Boiseites here? How about some Capellaites? Do we have any Capellaites in the room? Oh, come on. Do we have any of those Indiana, Indianaites? Indiana, Indiana? Come on. And how about, uh, I don't think we have any St. Clouders here. We do have a St. Cloud or visiting. We have any St. Cloud. How about San Diego State? Do we have any of our San Diego State? Pardon me? Well, I, I didn't, wasn't real clear, Don, whether I was picking the loan or something like that. So. If you feel deep affiliation, you can still stand. <laughs> right, 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 Something like that. Well, the other thing is that, uh, before I go any further, I really want to make it a point, just as... Your lunch is because we have sponsors. And uh, I, I, it was really kind of funny because we, we got enough money to buy chips. Which I asked. And, okay, and I, want, I, want, I don't want any waste on this table. I want you to know this is the most expensive lunch that you, simple but expensive lunch. So if you can't eat your potato chips, you're to save them and take them home for the squirrels. You can give them to the neighbor's kid, but we, there will be no waste at this lunch. I'm sorry, that's absolutely off limits. Right there, right there. You, you should have received a little flyer, okay, on both sides. I was absolutely overwhelmed. We had 14 people, uh, well, we had, um, I guess you could say, 11 people raise their hands and volunteer to be sponsors, and we had three chapters raise their hands. So those chapters have said, we will try to offset our chapter members' costs for lunch. So Atlanta, Chicago, and Denver were very gracious to do it. But we also had, we had some individuals on the back. Claire Carey, would you, Claire, would you stand up? Okay, I don't, uh, Jane St. she's with us. Uh, Joe uh, Durso, Unfortunately, due to the volcano, was stuck. Maybe we should save him a lunch. <laughs> well, do, you think we could, do you think we could refrigerate it and save it for him? I don't think so. He's in Paris. He won't want this. He's in Paris. He won't want this. Okay, or something like that. Uh, Don Snyder is one of our. Um, come on, Don, stand up. Janice, Janice Goodheim is here. Or just, I saw Janice. Where'd you go? There she is. Very, very nice. Very, very nice. And on the front, we have some other members who have uh, one of their own companies recognized. You do like that's why you got the little red bags. That's uh, uh, Becky Harris. Becky, stand up. There she is. And uh, uh, Chuck O'Keefe is Chuck with us. Oh, he just said it Monday. Okay, well that's great. We'll take it. Something like that. Uh, Pat, Pat's here. Pat is actually in the new class, okay? Um, I'd like you to know that when Pat got his CBT, he was promoted, he got a bonus, and he has a job opening, which he has posted. But he donated his bonus to the lunch. How did that happen? Wow. Uh, Jim Perry. I, I've seen Jim. There he is, back there. I know he's somewhere. He started his poem. We have Lynn Carney. Come on, stand up. Uh, 
Roger, Roger Addison, get up out of the way. Sit more, sit more. I saw you somewhere. There you go, there you go. Right. And uh, I don't know, is Daryl with us or not? Okay, now I promised some of these people hugs. So Jane and Daryl got their hugs. I don't know. So, and, and some people got stars. If I missed you on the star, then let me know. I'll be happy to give you a star. And if I owe anybody a hug, I promise to hug. Now, I'll be working also with John Chen to get out a message about you in the Performance Express and the CPT update. I, I really, I can't I applaud you for stepping up and continuing in our ability to get together, have lunch, network, and all those kinds of things. But again, there will be no waste. I want to be real clear about this, okay? If you know it, you just take them home. Right, and feed them to the squirrels, if nothing else. That's what I don't care about, something like that. Well, um, I'm going to give you a little update. I'm kind of reviewing this a little bit here. We have officially certified 1,104 CBTs. I have 100, uh, I, have, I have almost 130. I, I am real confident that I have 128 people in the pipeline. Those are candidates. Those are people who have paid for the designation but haven't completed the paperwork. And I'm expecting that paper will get fairly, well, over the next couple of months or something like that. Uh, some of you might have heard about the USA deal. Uh, USA is a major government agency. They're going to be letting some $200 million in contracts. And they wrote in the specification that to be, you had to be certified in HPT. Isn't that interesting? They use the famous unpopular initials, HPT. And I called them when I talked to them about that. We didn't drive that. They drove that. I said, well, how did you get here? And they said, well, we see a significant difference in our bidders who have the designation. Their work is more sustainable compared to the bidders and their work that they put out. So part of this is our government trying to not just spend money, but spend money that has lasting effect because they see themselves grinding out lots of money annually and it's like redo, 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 redo and not really looking at what it takes for sustainability. Uh, I also want to, so I'm really excited about that. I will be in contact with them. Uh, that's opened some other doors to a number of other companies that we're coming in and doing in-house programs and I think it's going to lead to some other uh, opportunities for us. We also are continuing to uh, shape and influence uh, curriculum. How many of you in the room are adjunct faculty? See the hands? There's a lot of you. Do we have any full-timers in the room? And we have a couple full-timers. Very good. Well, my point is because we're in a position to begin to shape uh, our, our curriculum. And uh, so I'm very excited. I personally have been working with Purdue uh, Calumet, Franklin University, uh, Grantham University, Roosevelt, Northeastern, okay? So th we're trying very hard to shape that. Now I know Boise and Cabell, they're already done. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about new universities or universities newly discovering this discipline and developing curriculum around our standards. I think it's very exciting. Uh, the other thing I want to update has to do with our relationship with SHRM. Last year, uh, one of our members was most gracious and uh, she helped us, it's Alice uh, Denninger, she helped us get our programs recognized for their certification. So if you are a member of SHRM, you have to get so many uh, extra hours to maintain your certification. And a percentage of those have to be in what they call strategic subjects. What's interesting is that our programs qualify for strategic credit. But we have to do that. Hot down, hot down. So, uh, so one of my goals is to actually um, uh, apply for SHRM for us to become an official recognizer of these kinds of programs. And I'm going to be drawing on Alice's help to fill out the paperwork or something like that. Uh, real quickly, uh, industry teams, uh, some of them are doing very well, some are struggling, some are still norming and storming. Uh, they're all different things over the map. But yesterday, <coughs> You know, we had our industry team sessions, and I, I want you to know that the Admiral came, and the U.S. Coast Guard Admiral, and uh, Bill Yeager was kind of gracious enough to host that. But you know what got him to the table? It was one of our panelists, our own Rear Admiral, Donald Crisp, retired, 
who was a U.S. Navy. And when he heard another admiral was going to be at the table, he decided maybe he could be at the table. So, uh, but his final, his final comment was, you know, we get more than we give. So we need, you know, I think that's very powerful. So we need, we need people of that status to understand that affiliation with ISPI benefits them, and they benefit us. So I was really excited. I'm getting ready to tell you that uh, I have been invited to actually visit a ship <laughs> that's on the uh, Michigan, Lake Michigan, and it's an ice cutter. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it's the new technology. It's the kind that goes, goes up and crushes the ice rather than rams it. And I've been asked, so I want to do the tour. <laughs> right. So I have. I've got the word of it. I love all those guys. We're going to see what happens. Now, now I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. I'm going to ask all of you to put CPT in your signature. I'm amazed at how many of us, our CBTs and our email addresses, we don't put it after our name. It's not on our business cards. It's not on our stationery. And then we want to know why nobody knows us. You are our marketing group. So I just ask you, think about it. You, know, you can certainly put your academic degrees. You, I'm not talking about that. I want you to really think hard about going back and putting the CBT on your signature. I'm asking for you to do that. I need you to spread the word. I need you to have the conversation. What's those numbers about? What's that mean? That's how we started. So think about it. Because I'm always intrigued at the number of us who send me emails and the CPT doesn't appear anywhere in their signature. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> also, you're going to be hearing from me soon because I have, whoops, I have another request. You know, one of the things that we get asked for are stories. Um, do you have examples in, uh, know, in call centers? Do you have any examples of this stuff in healthcare? Do you have any examples of this stuff in the finance department? Do you have any examples of this stuff in understand field sales? Do you have any examples of this stuff? So I've been working with the help of uh, Don, with her hand Don, okay, and some other groups, but we're, and we've been testing out a template. I'm going to be asking you to repurpose your own application. I don't want to make it hard or something like that, but I'll be sending this out. I'm going to be asking you to dust off that application, and retell your story. You get a choice about whether or not you want to name the company and keep that silent. You get a choice about if you want to give your own name, you can keep that silent, or you can toot your own horn. But I'll be asking you to list the, the industry and the function and some interesting things so that we can put in uh, our new content management, knowledge management system, whatever we call it, so that people can search based on industry and function. So they can pull up and get some examples. Wouldn't that be nice, right? And you get to populate, so you get to decide what you want to share, right? So I want to—I want you to know—I'm going to be ringing your chimes, okay, over the summer, and I'll be asking you to take dust off. If, if you lost your application, can't remember what you submitted? Let me know, because I have it. Okay, so I'll do that. All right. The next thing I'm going to talk about is that we uh, continue to get uh, a request related to can you recognize my workshop, can you recognize my course, can you recognize what we're doing inside, can you recognize, can you recognize. There's an increasing interest in an ISPI blessing, okay? So uh, I have been working very nicely with a team. Who's here on my uh, accreditation team? I've got some people. Maury's on it, uh, Chase Beck's on it, Sid Moy's on it. Anybody else here on the team? We have some, we have some really been doing some nice stuff, and it's, it's uh, developing some prototypes. We're actually in the process now of doing a pilot with JetBlue. JetBlue has eight colleges, and they want their work recognized. And I said, why'd you come to us? You can go to ANC, you know, you can go to all these other places. And they said, you're, you're the one that recognizes outcomes. We're looking at all these others. You fill out all the paperwork, you do like something like that. But it's nothing, but you're never asked whether I made a difference. We want to be recognized for what made a difference. 
So that gets me there. Okay. Anyway, so uh, we're doing those kinds of things. So um, we also uh, experimented with a new uh, partnership, and this was with Stephen Kelly. I saw him here earlier. Of course, Stephen. Oh, there he is back there. We worked with Stephen Kelly and his firm. Uh, we have the Certified Performance Based Project Management designation. And they, his company, used CBTs to recognize, uh, they recognize 17 people. And is it in Eastern Europe, Stephen? It's in uh, Cyprus. Out of Cyprus. Out of Cyprus. Uh, Tim Eskew did some of that work. And so we actually helped them to develop a recognition that is CS, ISPI endorsed and things like that, but it's performance-based project management. We have a lot of people get degrees in certified project management, can't do squat. <clears throat> that was a technical term, okay? <laughs> so we have submitted a motion to the board which has been passed for us to explore other credentialing efforts, so I'll explain. Well, with that, I know you're here really to hear our panelists, and I would like to ask my panelists to come up, and if you could, I, I really appreciate that. So I want you to be in the first chair, okay? Uh, uh, rear end, uh, Chris, but you'd be in the second chair. Joe, as I said, is he, he's still struggling getting out of France. We don't want to feel too bad for him. Belle Ann, are you here? There she is, okay, very good. Patty, if you'll come over here. Uh, Stacy is also unable to join us. So we have the four of them here. Okay. I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about I want to move over. And, and um, in our effort to be conservative and explain this, the hotel wanted 180 bucks for a hand mic. So we're going to pass this one around. Got how it works? Okay. Sorry. Eat those chips. They were five bucks a bag. Okay. <laughs> I tried arguing for apples. They wanted five bucks an apple. So you lost out. Sorry. Didn't get it there or something like that. So, I want to, you also have on your, on your table, you have a little half page paper that tells you a little bit about update, I sent out a call, I said for this year I want to do a panel and I want to start telling the story about my CB2s who are working in unusual arenas or venues. Some of you heard me talk about our fire marshal, <coughs> Kevin Wilson is unable to join us. <coughs> Kevin is absolutely loves us and he does a lot of work on the national level to shape policies related to fire rescue. He's on our emergency management team. I think that's nice. I think I've told you that we have two pharmacists. I think that's pretty neat, you know. And, and we have, and in reading your recertifications, how do I find these people? I find them reading your recertification forms. That's the most interesting reading. I mean, it's, it, I'm amazed at the type of work you put on. You blow people's socks off. The kinds of things that we're involved in, either directly in our work or in our volunteer work, it's just amazing. That's where I find out who's writing books, who's doing volunteer work, who's serving in new capacities, and something like that. And that's actually how I kind of discovered this group here, or something like that. So uh, Vince, he's on the committee or something like that. He said, but you need my roles change this brand. You know, I'm actually here responsible for performance delivery. He's going to tell us what that means in a minute. And this is actually how I discovered uh, Rear Animal Crisp. You know, I have to tell you, I was a little surprised that we had a female rear admiral in the Navy who's a CPT. I think that's hot day. So anyway, what happened here is that, you know, and then I start reading, she said, Hawaii, Claire. I know. <laughs> right? Where I should be. <laughs> right, right, right. And doing some very, very interesting work, and I'll have her tell her a little bit about that or something like that. And then I get Bell Ann here. And Bell Lamb is a chief financial officer. That's one of those peoples that we were trying to learn to talk to and communicate with, right? She's one of those peoples. So I said, how, you know, how, how, how did this happen? Something like that. She's going to tell us that story. And then Pat, now Patty, I've known Patty for a 
little while. Here she's out on mission go or something like that. And yes, she sort of does not work. She really works in marketing, but she's on the panel really because of her starting a not-for-profit, which helps keep people and their animals together. And I it just really do it's a very, very interesting work that way. So I thought it would be interesting for us to hear from them a little bit. So we're going to start out with, I'm going to just ask you to go down, holding this, and just tell us quickly what you do or did, okay? And then we'll go from other specific questions. heroes 
and return them to their sons, their daughters, their husbands, and the wives, and, and basically give you back your ancestors with a full honor arrival, as if your, your person that you loved had just died in the current conflict. And, and it meant so much. So I had the, the honor of meeting the people that we impacted, and also the honor of taking a full spectrum of staff, of very, very young um, men and women who had served multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, and this was their down tour. And what that means is you're away from your wife or your husband and your children for a year when you're in combat. When you come back to reconstitute yourself, one doesn't normally select a command where you're then deployed 50% of the time to very, very arduous places. So my, uh, so in the, in the Navy, as I said, I started in Vietnam. When you start in a, in a time of war, many people are deployed in combat. So therefore, if you are not a combatant individual, you are given a wide variety of functional areas you can go into. So I, I, I basically went into many different areas. So I had finished on the Joint Chiefs of Staff as the head of human resources, uh, the most senior human resource, and Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt for the Department of Defense. And I was given the honor of commanding JPAC. So I had the opportunity to fly out into just the most arduous places you can imagine, the places where our heroes died. And you would go for 32 hours of flight, and you'd fly in, and you'd keep flying, and then all of a sudden you'd be on helicopters, and you'd be flying from Hilo to Hilo to get out to these very primitive places. Um, Again, just it was an honor to do that, but it was a challenge. And as a CPT, I looked at the command, and if the commander spent all of their time traveling throughout the world negotiating contracts and doing all the speaking engagements that you could do, you would never be at home to be with the people that needed you to also look at their processes. So when I took over the command, the manning was very, very um, minimal. So the central identification lab was in the 60% manning. And in the rest of the command, it was 80%. There were people living in stairwells and in fire exits. They had their offices. And I'd go, why is your office at that doorway? And they'd say, well, it's the only place I can find, and, and it's got a window. And I'd say, no, this is a safety issue. You can't have somebody's desk in front of a fire exit. So this sort of gives you, you know, the feeling, leaky roofs, uh, hardworking, wonderful people, and all they cared about was the mission. They really didn't care about their quality of life. So what I've done uh, for today's presentation is just to go over the 10 steps that we use as a daily way of living and show you how, how as a chief executive officer, uh, I use them with this wonderful command to create a CPT environment. So the first was focus on results. Well, the primary result of this command was to identify human beings. And so that was the key focus. The other key focus was safety. So I sort of already explained how dangerous this could be. I mean, you could have young, young kids going up the ice cliffs, diving 100 feet under the water, searching for people out of Hilo. So very, very dangerous work. Safety was a, a key focus and identifications. There are 84,000 missing from all of the wars. And we had identified 1,520 at that point. We did 70 missions, and we identified 70 people a year. So those were the basic stats when I took over. 
Then it was, when you take a systemic view, it is a very complex um, system in doing uh, identifications, recoveries, and research. And it dealt with nine separate commands. It had never been flowcharted. No one truly understood how they interacted with each command. They knew in their heart, because many of the people had worked there for 20 years, but they had never actually flowcharted. In adding value, we, we set up intermediate goals. So the first goal I did was, let's just have a 5% improvement on identifications. But I worked that with the staff, so it would be on a five-year running average. So they all felt comfortable that, that with a five-year running average, they could do a 5% improvement. We wanted to increase research and development of new ideas and new ways of doing identification. In our particular area, the, the people that were returned from North Korea had gone through a mortuary in Japan where their bones had been soaked in formaldehyde. Great idea in, in, at the time of the Korean War, and it did in, in fact save the bones. However, it destroyed the DNA. And so DNA today is so critical in trying to figure out exactly whose ancestor you are that the staff was encouraged in group meetings to, to think out of the box and come up with unusual ways of doing identification through research and development. Also, we looked at soil. Uh, People were beginning to notice that the bones that were being recovered from Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia were very small. But you could still get an entire skeleton from Europe, from Korea. And it was because of the acidity in the soil. So we began a project with how long, is, how long do we have to continue to dig in these countries where we can actually get remains and also we focused on increasing the manning and identifying the high demand, low density skill sets that we had. The fourth step in establishing partnerships, we went out to higher sides of Department of Defense, which would be the Office of Secretary of Defense. We branched out into the Joint Chiefs of Staff and made partnerships with them. We made partnerships with Congress. We went to family groups and veterans groups we also went to foreign nations. So we began whole new negotiations, for instance, with India. Many, many people were, were lost, many Americans were lost during World War II as they flew over a very dangerous area called the Hump, which is a section between China and India where the planes were basically you're flying and the mountain just comes up and you're crashing into the mountain, and then the jungle swallows you up within months. The jungles will just go over the plains. And so many of the grandchildren were very interested in finding their ancestors. So we began negotiations with India for the first time and renegotiated uh, in China. Developing performance analysis, we looked at uh, the organization itself. The organization was a hostile merger between two commands five years ago. So what I mean by that is you had an army command and a navy command, and you woke up and you said, I don't care whether you love each other or not, you're now JPEG. So when I arrived, people were still saying, well, I may be JPEG, but I'm really the Central Identification Laboratory. And it still has the Army logo over the lab. And then you'd walk to the other, say, well, I'm really the Joint Task Force for Accounting from Vietnam. And I'd say, well, isn't this a worldwide mission? Well, it is. You know, but, but we, our hearts are where, from where we started. So, so we knew we had an issue, and it doesn't make a difference whether it's general dynamics and yous that are merging. Whatever, whatever you do, when you get two totally different cultures forced to live together, you have that whole storming and norming to go through. Uh, no data had been kept. And so I thought, wow, 20 years of information and data. And so we began compiling the data and charting the process. 
in the cause analysis, we all sat down and said, what's keeping us from identifying these wonderful heroes? Primarily it was space. I'd already talked about how people were crowded, but if you looked at the laboratory itself, it was probably a little smaller than this room with 16 tables on it. Well, when you end up with a large number of remains that come in, you cannot identify them on 16 tables. Nor can you do it if Dawn has to leave and go to Cambodia, but she's got a project laid out on a table. Then she has to pull it all together, put it in a box, and the three weeks it took you to put it to, to assemble that person is, is basically lost, and you sort of start again when you come back from your deployment. So we knew we needed space. We knew we did not have enough forensic scientists. There is, skeletal forensic science, as exciting as it is in bones, you have people being graduated in, throughout the United States, but you only get 10 PhDs a year. The work that we did required a good number of PhDs. So we basically had, I would say, a good 20% market share of the world to begin with. So when you stamp your foot and you say you want more, it takes a lot of work to get there. New equipment, family reference samples again for DNA, when you start going back through uh, DNA to find out who that person is. Designing solutions, so we designed temporary space, permanent space, we created a human capital strategy, develop and test for the solution, we started building the space, we figured out the number of people we needed. Uh, we tried to figure out how to close a site faster, which uh, we did through what we call P2T. And just in a, in a nutshell, if you look for where a jet plane goes down, it scatters for a very long distance. And, and you'd say, why are you going back five times to that same site? Isn't there a way of trying to determine a smaller patch of ground well, there is. If you go out and plug holes throughout that entire area, you can begin to basically narrow down where you believe that skeleton will be. And so by that process change, we began to, to make the pace of operations go faster. Did a lot of training in Lean Six Sigma, created a forensic science academy, created a recovery academy, so we implemented, we doubled the size, we had a human capital strategy that then had compensation, retention, scholarships, local market supplements, and at the end of it all, there was a 30% increase in identifications, a 20% decrease in the cost of doing a mission, and rather than take an average of 3.2 visits per site, it was down to 1.3 visits for site to close it and get it done. So that's, that's all I really had prepared to share with you <laughs> of, of taking the whole 10 steps and applying them to a forensic science lab and a worldwide operation. Thank you. I just want to say um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to meet uh, many of you, and I think uh, many of you would join me saying it's an honor to meet you. <laughs> and, uh, I, I'm going to be the Jerry Springer portion of the show, I think, compared to. <laughs> uh, but my name is Bella Ann Hyden, and I am the Chief Financial Officer for a financial planning and accounting firm. And I have been a Chief Financial Officer for many years of accounting firms, public accounting firms. Uh, and, but I learned about uh, or became interested in um, HPT, OBM, Organizational Behavior Management, as I was a controller uh, for a large local uh, accounting firm in Dallas. Uh, it was very interesting to me that I could sit day after day in a room full of accountants, partners of accounting firms, and as we would look at our metrics, uh, we always didn't have success as we tried to move those numbers. So when uh, I got uh, into the Department of Behavior Analysis at UNT and got my degree, got exposed to all of that, learned about Gary Rumler, Dale Brethauer, Bill Abernathy, uh, all of a sudden things started to change for me. Uh, when I would look at a financial statement, 
I always felt like that for me was a road map. And that was a map for uh, what people needed to do. If the people didn't show up, I knew that it didn't matter what a great strategy we had developed as a team or what great numbers I had, it wasn't going to happen if I, didn't, if I wasn't able to go back and drill down into the financial statements or, uh, and break it down into the people. So uh, just over the years, uh, some of the things that we've done, of course, is, is, is I've gone into companies. I've been a CFO for three uh, public accounting firms probably in the last 15 years is always start, you know, with the processes, uh, the things that would, you know, come naturally, but try to shore those up. Uh, the other thing that I use uh, my CPT and where it becomes very handy is also in developing uh, people. Uh, they constantly need development, especially as we try to align them with our strategic initiatives. Uh, one thing that I think has become important over the years is because you do have different levels of performers, especially with the a group like in a public accounting firm where you have a group of professionals that, you know, they're CPAs and they kind of tend to operate within books of business and types of clients and different types of expertise was through compensation. So I think my claim to fame in the accounting industry has been uh, to come up with a combination balance scorecard and pay for performance plan for them, uh, which has been very phenomenal, I guess, uh, from the industry standpoint, uh, because it makes... Um, does not make compensation a fixed cost. So as uh, the market at, for businesses, as the market, uh, business rise the market, you know, when times are good, people, you know, may always need a CPA, but they not, may not always need all the services. The compensation in a very fair way becomes variable. So uh, you, you earn less when the company earns less, and you become affordable to the, to the company, so you don't have to lay people off, which is, what has happened to us when we were in a financial planning firm is when the market fell in 2008 and we lost about 40% of our revenue, everybody understood, as our metrics were tied to some of that, that, that you know, we didn't have to let everybody go, which was wonderful. We didn't have a brain drain just trying to keep the company afloat, but that we were all in this together and we knew we were going to write it up again. Uh, the other thing that I do now that I work for a financial planning firm is what we do is we um, uh, do advising to high net worth individuals and then also to HR company and HR departments within companies to manage uh, make sure that they they're being able to have the right benefits that are affordable to their company and that their participants um, uh, take advantage of those benefits and maximize them and then we do financial planning for those executives as well but all of those are each individual performance improvement programs for each of those so from a marketing and from a what we sell standpoint uh, how we position it now is whenever we meet with, whether it be the uh, head of the HR department or the back office or high net worth individual, they, we have a plan that we work out with them and we try to increase the likelihood that they're going to be able to manage and achieve the goals that they set forth within those programs, within their plans in order to meet their goals, either the goals of the company or their individual, individual goals. I'm Patty Radikovic, and I'm the founder and chairman of Basil's Buddies, which is a nonprofit and a welfare organization. And I just wanted to say um, thank you, Judy, for inviting me to be on this panel, and thank you, everybody, for com coming to listen to me, <laughs> find out more about how I incorporate my the use of my CPT into my nonprofit. Uh, with my nonprofit, I will say that this is definitely my full-time volunteer uh, position, <laughs> not what I do to make money. Um, what our goal is, is our mission is to improve the lives of domesticated and companion animals um, and to reduce the homeless population by utilizing alternatives to euthanasia. Um, but within that, we're not just an animal organization, we focus on people too. Um, I like to say we help the underdog, whether that underdog is a dog or a person. Um, so really we're about helping to keep pets with their people, and that involves both sides. So what our long-term goal is, our 10-year plan, is to actually set up a, um, not a small, but a uh, large animal sanctuary in southeast Michigan. We're looking at about 1,200 acres. Um, if anybody's heard of Best Friends in Utah, we're trying to model ourselves out of best, off of Best Friends. I've been out there and talked to them, have some context there. And what we want to do with our facility is, like I said, have the facility as a sanctuary for companion and domesticated animals. But we want to do something a little bit different with a twist. So we're also going to be setting up a residential facility for homeless people. 
to bring them in, have them work as the caregivers, help them get back on their feet, pay them a living wage, and have it a rotational program where, you know, hopefully like within a year they'll be able to get back on their feet and then go out into the job market and move on from there. Um, so that's kind of the program that we're trying to set up is to really help both people and animals. So in order for us to get there, we have to figure out where we're going to start. Um, well, I, I uh, put together this organization last year. We are a 501c3 with the IRS. And what we decided to do for this year is to really focus on programs where we're truly um, helping people and animals and bridging the gap between what the traditional rescues offer right now and what pet owners actually need due to this economy. Um, one of the things we're working on um, is setting up a food bank for pets. So that's one of the things is people have to give up their animals because they have to choose between feeding them or their kids. And it really shouldn't be a choice. Um, we've had two buildings and, which have fallen through, unfortunately, but we've got some more things in the work so right now. Um, we had a, already one successful spay-neuter clinic. Uh, we were able to provide low-income spay-neuter services to help stop the overpopulation. We were able to do about 53 animals in six hours, which is a pretty big feat. <laughs> you can ask our vet staff. They, uh, they did a wonderful job at doing that. Um, one of the programs we're going to be launching nationwide is we actually are providing services to pet owners who are, are not able to get assistance from any other program. So for instance, a family that maybe doesn't have kids, so they're not qualified um, through programs in the United Way, or they're not at a certain age, um, and they can't qualify for senior programs, but they still need assistance. So we've already helped several families with this, where we coordinate with the local groups, uh, wherever they are. We act as the intake organization, so people can donate through us, they get a tax deduction, um, nobody has to give out individual names. And we're able to collect goods for both the animals and the people, whether it's funding for veterinary care, um, clothing for the people, food uh, for both people and animals, and then we're able to deliver that. So we're going to be launching that program nationwide um, very soon. And like I said, we've already done that in a few places. And um, really, like I said, we're trying to just bridge the gap between you know, what is out there right now and what do people actually need. And that's kind of where I bring in my, uh, my CPT knowledge is to be able to go out and do these analyses and say, you know, what's missing? What do people really need? How do I keep these animals out of the rescue group to keep them with their people because it's better all around for everybody? And I'll give you a, a situation that just happened this week while I'm out in California. I get a phone call on Tuesday, a panicked phone call that says, um, one of the local pounds just found out this morning that their budget has been cut and at 5 o'clock today their doors are closed and any animals left will be killed. And I'm like, what am I, I'm in California, what am I supposed to do? Um, I, they, of course, it's time difference, so I had two hours to figure out something to do. Um, and because I had already have my processes in place, I know who I have to go to, I have uh, volunteers on the ground within 45 minutes, I was able to set something up so I could call them back and say, pull everything. We've got a place for them to go. So now, of course, when I get back, I have to figure out what to do with them. But <laughs> at least they're safe right now. Um, so how I incorporate my, uh, my knowledge in the organization is, one, is just the whole structure of the organization. Since it is my organization, um, I can build it any way I want. And I can set it up the right way using, um, using my uh, CPT and HPT knowledge. I can set up the organization so that we have good processes, that we're efficient, um, we're always focusing on results, we're always going back to our mission, we don't do anything that's, um, you know, we have volunteers, I have to respect their time, so I don't do anything that's wasted time. Anything that anybody does, I want to make sure that it's, it's helping us to achieve our end goal. Um, we're able to be very nimble uh, because we can have these processes in place. Um, we partner with a lot of other rescue organizations because the thing right now with our group is we actually don't do rescue, which is funny because I just pulled all these animals. Um, <laughs> but we've chosen not to do rescue at this point because there are groups out there that are doing it really well and all we need to do is partner with them and we want to focus our time and energy and money on other programs that, to offer these services that they don't offer. Um, so partnerships for us are really important. And within the rescue community, if you're not familiar with animal rescue, um, there's a lot of infighting. So <laughs> a lot of times bridging, making partnerships is actually pretty difficult. And we're able to come in because we're not doing rescue, because we offer these other services, we've actually been able to pull some rescue groups together that have not worked together in the past. So we're able to develop this community, which is really nice, and try to get rid of all the, the past infighting that's been going on and really focus on 
you know, the end result that we all want. So, in a nutshell, that is uh, my organization and what I'm doing and how I'm using my HPT uh, to do it. So, thank you very much. Now, I just want to point out, this is four. Okay? There's many more of you all doing some incredible work, something like that. So, why don't we... Uh, do you have some questions of our panel? Paul. <laughs> um, I, you know, the training has shown up in some of what you're doing. I've also noticed that it's your non-traditional fields or industries using it on our approach. So, you know, what, what are your individual thoughts about being maybe the only one who thinks the way you do in your area, and how is that sort of attractive or inspirational for other folks who don't don't come at the world, say, from a training and development background, who might look at this as a as a, an association, an organization, and a certification that they would want to get. I'm, I'm not sure I framed it in a good question. But, He's writing us a story so far. Anybody want to try this? Your non-traditional environments, what? how are you attracting others, or how could others in your area be attracted to this? Well, I never knew it was training. <laughs> I, in <laughs> fact, I didn't even know it was HPT. I thought it was process improvement for everything. And so it never occurred to me that we had limited ourselves. And so maybe if we just think of it that way and we don't limit ourselves. These steps can be used in any discipline, whether it's equipment or function. And so maybe if a lot of people started in a training venue, but I've noticed from the briefs that they've all gone on to do fabulous things. I know I don't think Roger's here, uh, shall you? Well, anyway, he, he started in training, but then he was talking about nuclear power and all these other areas he'd gone into. And I'm sure all of you, as you've gone on, have done fabulous things in other areas. So, uh, anyway, I would just say don't consider yourself just that and invite other people. Yeah, I would totally agree. Uh, to me, HBT, what we do is, is not a HR thing. It's not a, a training thing. It's really, if you're dealing with people and you want to improve performance, you're, you're practicing HBT. And I, I see a lot of folks within my business group that are doing this, just they, they just don't know it. And so what I do is I, I just ask them, so, you know, I have an individual come says, I don't know I can do that HBT stuff. And I said, really? I said, so let me ask you something, because I see them at work. I said, when you're at a meeting, are you really do you care about the results you get? Oh yeah, that's the first thing we talk about is the results. I said, so you're result focused? He goes, yeah. I said, okay. I said, do you just focus on your area? Or do you look at things holistically? He goes, oh no, we, we look at everything. We, we look at, oh, so your system is thinking. He goes, yeah. Okay. Do you think you add any value to what you, oh yeah, absolutely. We won't do it if we don't add value. I said, okay, so you value that. And you do this by yourself? He says, absolutely not. I bring in all kinds of people. He says, okay, so guess what? You're doing HPT. <laughs> and that's our SVP right there. And so they, that's when they say, ah, oh, I didn't know that. And, and so mm -hmm. it, it's just about improving performance. So when people see that they're practicing it, what HPT or what we, I try to help them understand is this brings us a common language. And, and so by us understanding HPT and the standards, we all now are going to speak the same language and we can help each other grow in that discipline. And so that's what gets them attracted to it. Once they understand that they've been doing this all along, it's for them to understand. Two of the folks that got CPTs for this year's class were two folks in Sprint that I uh, uh, mentored when they came in. They didn't even know anything about HPT. They joined our organization and they called me. As, I was a single CPT in Sprint at the time. Uh, and they asked, I said, how can we get that? And so I started talking with them. I said, you've got plenty of experience. You just need to write it up. And they didn't know how to do that because they couldn't speak the language. So once we talked about the language and how to write it up, they both submitted their application. They're both CPTs now. And these are people that before joining Sprint didn't even know what HPT 
was about, but they've been doing it all those years. Uh, the, the way that I do it, mine is we include it in our marketing materials. So when we're presenting ourselves to either that high net worth individual that we're saying we're going to be your personal CFO or to that HR person, we bill ourselves as a team of professionals. That when you get CFO for Life, which is our company, you're going to get a certified financial planners, you're going to get a, cer a certified public accountant, an MBA, and a CPT. Uh, and then we, you know, everybody knows, we pr presumably think they'll know what that is, but for the ones that don't or are brave enough to ask, they'll ask what that is. And we'll say, well, that's the expertise that's going to make it more likely that we're going to be able to serve you. We set up our internal uh, systems to do that way, and we're going to do the same for you to make sure that, that uh, we're able to deliver that, or our services to you as well. So we use it as a, to make it, a, 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 to increase the likelihood that we're going to be able to deliver the service, and you're going to accomplish your goals. And we just say it's those things, you know, so that is part of the team of professionals. Um, for my organization, it's really, I let the results speak for themselves. Um, we are an all-volunteer run organization, but yet we are extremely efficient, extremely nimble. Um, people are amazed at how quickly we can turn things around and how quickly we can actually achieve big results. Um, I get a very a big following, actually, from volunteers because of this. They want to, because a lot of times you go to a volunteer organization and it's a little bit haphazard. Um, I run a pretty tight ship um, with, the, with my volunteer organization. I have a lot of people that are, are, are ready to come on board. Um, I have a lot of interest from other CPTs and people that practice HPT to actually come in and help us because we do training for volunteers and, and, and various things like that. Um, so really it's like for us, as I let the results speak for themselves, People that want to know how you do what you do, especially when they find out I actually work 70, 80 hours a week at a regular job, but yet still, still run the volunteer organization, um, and they want to find out more. And so that's when I can say, well, you know, this is my background, and this is how we do it. And so I've had some people that were interested in, you know, looking at their organization, saying, oh, well, I think I want to do this at my work too. What do I need to do now? Um, and so they're looking at our organization as a result of it. Yeah. <laughs> 